Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts Nina and Kyle. I am Kyle. I'm Nina. Today is May 1, or at least at the time that they're recording, it's May 1. I mean, I just finished my midterm, so that's the reason why we're recording today. It's so late. Instead of yesterday, like normal podcasters, I don't know. But anyway, today we celebrate our laborers knowing how important they are to society. And more importantly, today is a time for us to recognize their struggles and how much farther we need to go in order to achieve justice for all workers. So before we move on, I guess we could talk about some, you know, fun facts about Labor Day, Sigura, its history. Because we did this several times on the Discord. I think it's just fair that we do it now so people who aren't on the Discord can relate, you know? I don't know. But by the way, join our Discord. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> By the way, join our Discord. It's on our social media pages. We also have Debatable InterVarsity. It's shaping up to be a pretty hype tournament. So, mm-hmm. you know, you should register for Phase 1. We have a few more days left until the end of Phase 1. But anyway, here are some fun facts about Labor Day. Even though Labor Day is celebrated throughout the world, and it's also known as May Day, because like in most countries, the Labor Day is, is in May. For us, in the Philippines, it started in 1903, actually, because... Because it was the American colonial period. So in 1903, well, we are governing ourselves but subject to the whims of the American government. Basically something like that. And what happened then was there were a hundred thousand people on this day, more than a hundred years ago, who went to Malacanang demanding not only workers' economic rights but also Philippine independence. So that means that those two issues are not really divorceable, especially back then because the only way that they could have Of their economic rights is if you had Philippine independence. If you did not have independence, their ability to, you know, earn for themselves, have a dignified means of living would be restricted by the whims of our American colonizers. But also, here's another fun, fun fact, and this is actually the way that I've learned about Labor Day. Apparently, it was also meant to commemorate the time that we codified our laws on labor. So before, we had a lot of different laws about labor, but on May the 1st, 1974, all of those laws got collected into the same law, and we now call it the Labor Code. So this was a Marcus era kind of legislation. So you can say that it's a victory. Like, oh, Marcus might be good for the workers. <laughs> uh, you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. But like some people do say that just because the labor code was, you know, created during the Marcus era. So that's also a very interesting thing. But what you can see is there is always a trend where if you have very oppressive systems in place, usually the laborers who are most affected or most directly or immediately affected, they also end up wanting more victories during those times. So it happened during the American colonial period because they were disenfranchised for that huge period of time. It happened during the uh, the Marcus era because, you know, things were super hot on the rights front back then. So you can see that there's a trend there. But a- another question that we want to talk about, and this is the first very important issue that we want to talk about, is why Why is it really important to talk about labor rights? And by the way, none of this should be understood to be legal advice. That's very important for me to say. None of this should also be considered as like the end all, be all for these discussions. We have several discussions, and none of in none of them should you treat this podcast as some sort of like answer to all the world's questions. Like we still encourage people to research for themselves. But anyway, why is it important for us to talk about labor rights? Why are we making this episode? Even if I. still busy and Nina's no doubt still busy. She's in the middle of a tournament right now. Why are we still talking about it? It's because of this concept called social justice. The idea that if you have less in life, you should have more in law. And this was said by President Magsaysay. Basically, the idea here is the role of the state is to protect people who have less ability to protect themselves, right? And this is very important when you're talking about labor relations. Because not only does the state look at this from the executive or legislative branch, but it was also like enshrined in several Supreme Court decisions where if you take a look at the relationships between employers and employees, there is an inherent inequality that you find there. 
and that inequality usually tips in favor of the employer. Why? Because the employer has so many resources, it can, like, it has a bunch of people literally just doing their legal work. You are just one person, right? You're just one laborer. Or several laborers if you are, you know, if you're if you unionize. But basically, that's the reason why the state, constitutionally speaking, is required to give full protection to all Philippine labor. Whether or not you are organized, unorganized, part of a union, not part of a union, even if you are not here in the Philippines, if you're working abroad, if you're OFWs, the state still has the responsibility to give you full protection. And the Constitution doesn't say give full protection to employers, right? The only thing that the Constitution says about employers is that the state should manage employer-employee relations in order to make that inherent inequality less unequal. So that's the reason why it's very important to talk about Mm -hmm. labor rights. And this leads us really nicely to what we call wage justice. Because you see a lot of protests going on right now, and usually one of the buzzwords that they use is wage justice. So what really is wage justice? first. But before that, what is the difference between a wage and a salary? Because there are so many Twitter threads that exist right now, especially given the rise of the whole Ateneo person rejecting the 37k offer that was given to them for a marketing position. I think that's also a really salient point to discuss, but we'll probably discuss that somewhere later on. But what's the difference between a salary and a wage first? So the essential difference, actually, between a salary and a wage is that if you have a salary, you're getting paid a fixed amount for a certain period of time, regardless of how much time you actually spent during that period working. On the other hand, wages, if you earn wages, that means that you earn a certain amount of money um, per hour or for a certain period of time, as long as you work for that period of time, right? So if you are earning an hourly wage, that means that you could only get a particular amount of money by working for a certain amount of hours, right? So if you ha- if you are a salaried worker and the employer says, I will give you 37000 a month, if it's a salary, it doesn't really matter how you spend your time or how many hours you spend working. You will still get 37000 by the end of the month or somewhere within the month, whatever. But if you're a wage earner, you can still hypothetically get 37000 thousand a month but you will have to work longer hours depending on the wage rate that's Mm -hmm. given to you by the employer you might have to work longer or you might have to work a certain amount of time in order to get um that money so that's the main difference between wage and salaries can you Uh, make a hybrid of those things like you have a salary but you also have overtime that is composed of wages is that a thing well Yes, I suppose that you can make something like that. Uh, so again, this isn't legal advice, huh? but for example, <laughs> right? For example, there are lots of um, salespersons who go around and sort of sell you some stuff. Um, they will receive minimum wage. They will receive minimum wage no matter what. But depending on how much they sell, they will get commissions for each sale, right? So that will be added in, in some instances, that will be added on top of minimum wage. But I suppose it, it is possible for you to have, you know, both um, a salary and a minimum wage. It's just that I feel like if you're an employer, that's not really something that's strategic to offer a particular worker. Mm, that's fair. Yeah. There are also some people who, uh, there are also some employers who um, give sal- give remuneration because how they pay you. They pay you based <laughs> on output. They pay you based on output, not based on like the period, not based on like how long you work, but based on the output. There is a certain kind of scheme, they call this a Pacquiao basis. Basically, like, for every output that you create, you are paid for that output. Isn't that also a gig economy? Or a form of a gig economy? Yes, but also no. Because, like, um, w- the difference between that and the gig economy is that the gig economy, you are not really anyone's employer. Uh, you're not really anyone's employee, right? Mm. You, you get gig to gig, you gig to gig. So you're not really protected under um, laws that protect employees, right? And actually, if you take a look at unemployment benefits in the United States, that's also the problem that they're facing because for most people in the gig economy they're never considered employed they're never considered employees so if they become unemployed the law says they're contractual laborers only so they do not they are not entitled to unemployment benefits 
So that, that is also something that you can take a look at right now because you could be considered an independent contractor. So now even if you're an independent contractor, you still have, you know, some benefits. For example, even if you're an independent contractor, you can still get retirement. You still have to contribute to um either SSS or GSIS. I forget which one. I'm not mm-hmm. a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even if you're an independent contractor, you get certain rights. So there are many ways that you can go about paying laborers, right? But all of them, no matter what, they all deserve a certain standard of living, a certain standard of dignity. And that's the reason why wage justice is so important. So what even is wage justice? Wage justice, in order to understand that, you should first look at wage theft. Wage theft is generally seen as either non-payment of wages, as in, I was supposed to get paid this month, but I wasn't paid this month. Or it could also be underpayment of wages. That's like a very simple way to understand it. It's either you are not paid or you are underpaid. So, for example, you could have minimum wage. In Metro Manila, according to the Department of Labor and Employment, minimum wage in Metro Manila is 537 pesos per day for people who are working in a non-agricultural industry. If you're working in agriculture, that's 500 pesos a day. So, if you work 8 hours a day, that's what you should be getting, 537 pesos. So, that's around like 67, 68 pesos per hour. So, if you work 8 hours a day, that's what you should be getting. If you don't get that, and again, pangatong beses na, again, this is not legal advice, but if you're paid less than the minimum wage for the amount of work that you did, something might be wrong. So another example, so that was non-payment. Another example is underpayment. What if you do that same amount of work but you're not getting paid that amount of money? You're being paid less. Or what if you do 8 hours of work plus overtime but you don't get extra overtime pay even if you did overtime work and you still get paid, for example, 537 pesos. That's still wage theft because you are being underpaid. There was a percent of your wage rate um, that should have been added to that 537 pesos but was not given to you. That is also wage theft. So now, like, it's very easy actually because you can just do the computations yourself. Like, look it up. Um, it, it's, it's a wage order but like, you might say, okay, if it's so easy to see if you're not being paid or if you're being underweight, uh, underpaid, why is there still wage theft? The reason why there's still wage theft is because if you're a worker, sometimes it's very difficult for you to demand something even though you know that you deserve that thing because what if there is no union and you ask for um if you ask for the wages that you're entitled to and then suddenly they they just fire you or they call you entitled or something like that right that is something that's extremely common especially for people who cannot afford legal services so that's also one of the reasons why having a union is very important because part of your union contributions will be used to pay lawyers that will um that will fight on your behalf and that's also a strategy that i know that some employers tend to use they try to discourage unions by saying you're poor na nga eh. you're poor you need the wage that we're giving you why are you spending so much of that money to pay for a lawyer that you will not use or to a lawyer that you disagree with so that's actually quite debatable there are some cases where if you do not join a particular labor union that is cause for you to get kicked out of your uh, place of employment and that's not even because the the employer says so that's actually because the union says so in order to encourage people to join that union so i'm not mm-hmm. saying that all unions are like this there are just some unions that are like this. So that is actually quite debatable. Like, should you still be mandated to join the union? Although for me, personally, even though it might cost you more in the short run, if your union is very good, it feels like in the long run, it will work out better for you anyway. And even if your union wasn't that good yet, right? But your membership actually might benefit the union's development in the long run and in the short term as well, given that more members means more strength in numbers, means more money for them to actually fund the lawyers that you might need. So that's the first issue, right? Wage theft. But let's assume, let's assume you have a wage and that you're being paid properly, meaning that it's not delayed, um, they're paying you on time, there could still be a problem. So you might not be facing wage theft, but you might be facing wage discrimination. So that's the second issue in this debate, right? Or this, not this debate, but I, I'm still in debater mode because I have a tournament. 
I just broke in a tournament. Uh-huh. I'm like by the time this episode's out, I'm probably debating or, or like fingers crossed, I'm still debating in the out rounds, right? But second issue for this episode would be wage discrimination. There's a lot of basis for wage discrimination, but that's basically when you have a wage that either is not correct for your skill level or not proper for the position you're in in relation to what everyone else is getting. And there's a lot of reasons for wage discrimination, right? So there are three bases that I'd want to highlight. The first is probably going to be based on educational background. So a lot of schools, for example, especially in the United States, if you're from an Ivy League school, automatically, the bare minimum you get when you enter your first job is already leagues better compared to everyone else who went to community college, which I don't think is personally fair, given that education should not be something that continues to gatekeep how much people can earn. Though I do understand, right? Like the quality of your work may be different. I don't think that should be inherently assumed. But the problem is, it is inherently assumed, right? So that's a form of wage discrimination that takes place. You probably know this issue based on what took place on Twitter. A lot of people are saying that Athenians are entitled. Personally, I I think that they were just knowing their worth and demanding for more. And I think in general, a lot of people should be negotiating their wages and their salaries anyway. So I don't think it's much of a harm. What do you think, Kyle? (laughs) It was actually funny to me because like I saw this tweet that said um, that's the reason why I don't like hiring people from Ateneo or UP. It's because they know what they're worth. And I was <laughs> like, I mean, so, so like you agree, right? You agree that you don't want workers to know what they're worth. So like actually another question here isn't just like wage discrimination but also the fact that everyone is just generally underpaid. And I I think we'll talk about that later when we talk about the economic side of the issue. So I'm going to dip my toes into my mm-hmm. <laughs> into my degree <laughs> in my econ degree and I'm just like ah, I have to I have to do this. I have to, for the greater good. But anyway, for the greater good. But anyway, wage discrimination happens I think because we take too much consider like we take um so much we give so much premium on the kinds of schools or the grades that a person might have gotten um during high school or undergrad or even postgrad and the economic theory for this is those things like for example your grades right like why do you want to study to get higher grades it's because you're told if you get higher grades you will have more employers lining up to give you more money right but really grades are just there as guesstimates. They're just signals, indicators, economic indicators, but like they're just like stand-ins. They're estimations of how productive you will be as a worker. It has really nothing to do with how good you actually are. So that's the reason why you will always look at these issues and look at, "Mm, it's really bad that we treat some schools as being superior to others or some people with higher grades as inherently superior to others. As if people from those schools or with those grades are just inherently smarter than other people. That's not true. That's not true. Because it's just an economic indicator. It has nothing to do with actual skill, actual productivity, actual intelligence. But because we give so much premium to these indicators, they're like you, you create a lot of discrimination in the way that you give wages to people. So that's yeah. the reason why you, like the economic theory for this is it's an over-reliance on economic indicators that are often very arbitrary. Because like you can have great grades or bad grades, but it's not really depending on how hard you work or how good you are. But because of, for example, you could have had a terror prof. You could have had, you know, some other thing that happened to you in that part of your life it doesn't really talk about how intelligent you actually are yeah um another theory i would like to posit um so there's an economic side to it there's also an idea of optics from the lens of political science like a lot of soft power exists with these schools right like the ability to negotiate or like the perceived like they manage to posture themselves as prestigious for a reason and they maintain that by ensuring that their own graduates when they enter the workforce, still demand for that kind of prestige even outside of the school. So it's just like a logical extension of what they were taught to do inside the school. And then they move out and they still carry that vibe 
let's just call it a vibe they carry that vibe and demand that vibe, for, <laughs> that vibe and then they demand for the same kind of treatment so some schools sadly do not teach this kind of confidence to their students so when they end up graduating admittedly they settle for less and because so many people settle for less it became the standard like that you should demand only this much even if their value and their worth is so much more right there's a natural incentive when for employers to just downgrade people and make them feel bad when they ask for more like they'll tweet about it like what we saw right or like cancel certain schools for demanding more and knowing their worth etc so that's the first issue right based on educational background why wage discrimination happens but there's also the basis of sex so obviously we know of this thing called the gender pay gap if you don't know what that is the theory that women make approximately 81 or 82 cents to each dollar that a man earns this was an estimate in 2020 um that translates to 20 percent gender wage gap so obviously this is still being disputed the numbers always change but it's always been a constant that women earn less than men but this is also disputed by my favorite right-wing groups like PragerU where they said, Oh, if this were true that the women are paid less, and they, all the companies would just hire women. But hello, obviously there's a reason why there's also still discrimination in the workplace. Women are not perceived as good workers for some reason. Like they're too moody to be in engineering for some reason. Or they're too moody to do these sales. Or they're just going to bleed everywhere and not get the job done. So those are things that happen that cause wage discrimination and general discrimination against women in the workplace, right? But the gender pay gap remains even larger for women of color. And this is the part in, of intersectionality that people often forget. Like there's also a race angle to it, um, which I'll discuss later on, but just as a preview has really been pervasive because of the stereotypes that exist, both for people of different ethnicities and for women especially. There's also this weird argument that women get paid less because they get maternity leaves and that majority of the funds go to the fact that, you know, you're not going to be a good worker because you're going to be a mother anyway. Like, what I remember Kyle had a debate about this. Debatable kasi siya. Debatable kasi siya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what are your... I mean, they don't have to be your thoughts, but, like, what are different sides to it? Well, my argument there, I, I was... I remember that was a time when you had a new law that expanded maternity leave. So before it wasn't, it was just like a set amount of days. You made that number of days longer. I forget the exact number. And I don't want to bring it up because mm, I'm not a lawyer and I don't want I don't want people to think, oh, Kyle couldn't even get the numbers right. <laughs> but anyway, so the general issue, the context there was the amount of time that a person could take off and it's to paid leave um, for maternity leave um, was expanded. So we were under the unfortunate position where we had to defend limiting the benefits that women would have when it comes to maternity leave. So what we argued, and this is not our personal opinion, but this is actually something that people from PragerU actually have. Uh, just, just Republicans in general, or I suppose classical economists also have this opinion sometimes. Anyway, the opinion is, if you have maternity leave, it's paid even though they don't do work. So if they are getting paid for no work, that is just extra cost for no added benefit. So that means if you are going to um, hire someone who might get pregnant, so in other words, just women in general, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you hire women, you might have to spend more money for less results. And as a result, women just in general, would be seen as more costly for an employer to hire. So that is the way that you can harmonize the Prager U argument. Na, I know that they are so cheap. We pay them so cheap. But the reason why, even though we give them less wages, but you still do not hire more of them, is because you're not really saving on costs. The reason why you're not hiring them is because you feel like they are more um, costly. And a lot of the wage that you would have given to a man should be allocated instead to a fund that would be given to you in case of maternity. So that's the reason. And uh, our argument went even further and said that if you expanded maternity leave to this particular extent, it would just make the discrimination against the employability of women even more entrenched. You're just going to make the problem worse by doing this. I, and 
and again, I don't really believe this because you have a shit ton of benefits for men as well. Like there is also something called the paternity leave where you know a, a, a man does it because you know if if a woman um gives birth for example and she has to recover and she has to take care of the child, she doesn't necessarily have the ability to do it alone, right? If she's going to either focus on raising a child or recovering, you can't really do both, and that's the reason why you have something called the paternity leave as well. Although there is a problem here because the maternity leave can be availed of every time you give birth or every time you get pregnant. But under our law, you can only avail for paternity leave a certain number of times. So for example, pag the thing that's a third child mo, you can still have paternity leave. Pag the thing that's a fourth child mo, hindi na pwede, right? But sorry, you're, the first three are your only favorites. Like you're not allowed to have more than three favorites. Yeah, the, the first three, I don't know, by the time that you get to the fourth child, your first child would be older enough to take care of the fourth child. Ganun na. Oh, But no. Anyway, so, ayun. Uh, th- that was our argument for um, limiting the, the maternity leave. But that is one of the reasons why there is a gender pay gap because of these stereotypes. And also, there's a there's a really... Uh, it's, it's a less pronounced thing, but it's just as problematic. Where, actually, there is a practice where before you get employed or before you get hired, they make you sign a contract wherein if you get pregnant, you can get fired. And yeah. actually, that, that was a... There, there was a case where... Dumating kasi siya sa Supreme Court eh. But there was a case where um, a Saudi Arabian airline, I think... Um, fired a woman na um stewardess stewardess i was gonna say flight attendant um but they fired her because she got pregnant um and by when it wait is stewardess court, offensive i don't know i don't know but when it when it reached the supreme court the supreme court was saying that oh, we shouldn't discriminate against women so one so it actually still does happen right it even happens in some catholic schools as far as i know right it happens in some catholic schools mm-hmm. where unless you are married you cannot get pregnant <laughs> Because you're in a Catholic school, right? If you aren't mm-hmm. married but you get pregnant, that means you had premarital sex. That's a sin. So you can That's get fired sin. for that. The thing is, though, most of the time, even though that does happen, it doesn't reach the Supreme Court. Feeling ko, if it reaches the Supreme Court, it'll, the, the court will say, no, that's bad. You can't do that. But anyway, th- there are some exceptions then. Eh? Like, there are some regulations where we will hire you, but you cannot have a romantic relationship with someone from our rival company. So that actually still does happen. And weirdly What? enough, weirdly enough, that practice was affirmed. So I'm I'm not really sure why. I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, just from my studies, I'm, I'm still, you know, uninformed. But just from comparison, right, it's not, it doesn't seem to be super consistent. Maybe it's a secrecy thing. Like, it's valid because it's a company strategy to ensure that information doesn't leak out or something. Yeah, actually, th- that was the reasoning. That was the reasoning of the oh, company. Oh, nice. I but guess for right. me, but for me, it, it doesn't make sense eh. Because, sure, sure, right? If you are from Microsoft, why would you date someone from Apple? But, why is your freedom to choose who to love, who to marry? Why should those rights take a backseat um, to the right of the company to be very petty about corporate rivalries? I don't really get it. I, I suppose like you could, you could, you could sue, you could sue the, ano, the uh, employee if there's a leak, for example. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think you have to go to the extent of firing them for falling in love with someone from a rival company. It's weird. Romeo and Juliet, but make it corporations, you know? It's Romeo and Juliet, except make it capitalist. <laughs> I yeah. don't like Yeah, anyway, so that's it uh, f- for that section. So there's also wage discrimination based on sex, ba- basically. And the last would be based on ethnicity and nationality. So there's a lot of misconceptions and discrimination that seeps into the workplace because of like, stereotypes that we have towards certain people. Like a lot of Jewish people before could not get any work because there was a fear that they would legitimately steal money from the corporation when no one was gonna look, right? Or that black yeah. people were going to do the same. There's also a fear, for example, or like there's a premium on Filipinos in different in certain sectors. Like we're only good at being caretakers and nurses, and that therefore we get paid cheap because we're such an abundance of them, right? There's so there's such a surplus of us that it's easier to pay us low because we'd appreciate no whatever the whites give us. And that seems to be also a form of wage discrimination. It's positive in face value, sure. Like, oh, look at us, so good at caretaking. But it has legitimized how people have treated us badly as Filipinos and have 
like stereotyped us into that into that little box um and i'm sure a lot of different ethnicities have their own stereotypes i'm afraid of listing them down for fear that i am reinforcing those stereotypes by having them in my mind and having them as examples but i'm pretty sure some will come to your mind and that's what i mean right oh cancel yourself if you yeah. have to. <laughs> cancel yourself for that but yeah, yeah that, that, that's myself. actually a big thing like um there was a study i, I was gonna cite the journal where i read this but i forget the name of the journal but there was an article that i read a few years ago where they did an uh, they did an experiment where you just had equally qualified candidates for the same job position but they found that if you're a black person and you had a stereotypically black sounding name and I'm not gonna give a stereotypically black sounding <laughs> name like, don't cancel I yourself do not, either I d- yeah I don't I don't want but let's there is a stereotypically black sounding name. That resume is less likely to get accepted into like an interview stage, right? Damn. As compared to the same, exact same resume to the same With HR John rep, Smith. But John Smith or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But at the most stereotypically white name that you could think of, like Bob, Bob, I don't know. Um, Richard. Bob, Bob Richard. Richard. Bob Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so th- those kinds of people. Oh, I'm so sorry if there's like a Bob Richard listening to our episode. Like we we just like you gotta admit it's a white sounding name though. It Josh be Swain. White sounding. Josh Swain. There's there's so many Josh Swains that mm-hmm. they had a fight. But anyway, yeah, they, they the the researchers actually found that same CV, same resume, same employer, but different first names makes a big difference actually. So that is actually something that's very subliminal, I suppose like I don't think that like the HR rep gets a resume and goes like, huh? A stereotypically sounding black name. Then they twirl their mustaches and go like, I am not going to give you a job today. I, I don't think it's really like that. I, I think a lot of it is subliminal. Um, it's subconscious. subconscious. Well. Yeah. Subconscious, right? So th- there is still much to be desired. And there's the, that's a reason why actually, and there are some debates about um, double blind, double blind screenings or removing Removing um, the first names or just names in general, or r- removing like personal details in in the resume when it's being looked at by the the HR rep, because yeah. a lot of those things really do factor into whether or not um it's likely for you to get hired or at least move on to the interview stage of the application process. Yeah, so I wanted to discuss that as well. That's an aggravating factor. Like the fact that people know this information, have access to it, and can abuse it without any repercussions, right? Because it's hard to track down and ask, like, why didn't you accept me? Like when you get rejected from a job interview, you just have to assume for yourself why. So it's very difficult to actually get answers and get results and actually figure out you've been discriminated in the first place. So what's an aggravating factor as well is the lack of transparency in wages. So companies make sure that you're not asking each other what the wages each other gets are. Um, I know people think it's like a culture, like, oh, it's taboo to ask what your co-workers are earning. But actually, that is just something that has been drilled into us as society not to ask because that's what corporations want. There's no real reason for us not to know what our co-workers are earning, right? But the only reason is because companies make it very difficult for you to find out and discourage you from finding out because that's when you figure out that, hey, I'm not getting what I deserve. If my co-worker who has been here for a shorter time and is white is getting paid more than me when I do more or double the work that they are doing, right? Yeah, and I, I think this is also interesting, like, as a segue to the economic side of things. Because, like, again, we can go back to the issue from Twitter. I think it was today or yesterday. Two that days yesterday? ago, I think. Two days so, ago, blew up yesterday. You know, yeah. t- Twitter but yeah, it's, it's it's relevant to the oh my gosh, I'm speechless. There is someone who asked for 60k when I already offered them 37k. OMG, so entitled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you really hate that tweet, huh? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm really not fond of that tweet because the idea here is you should not be entitled to um, a particular standard of living that you feel like you deserve, right? So um, I, I, I get, I suppose I get where you're coming from, but where does this idea, now if, if you ask for a large amount of money, you are therefore entitled. Where does that mindset come from? I think that the mindset comes from the fact that there is actually some compassion Comparison for wages. So it's not as transparent as what you would want, Nina, but there is undeniably some comparison. The problem is those comparisons are not done while adjusting for other circumstances. So the idea, like one of the things here, I survived when I was younger, I survived 10,000 pesos a month. Nga eh. So you are complaining about 20,000. I only earned half of that. But they, the, the person who earned 10,000 a month, before they earned it like 20 30 years ago like if you factor inflation into that that 10,000 pesos would be worth so much more now right and I remember I was giving you some computations where yep, if you earn 10,000 pesos in 1970 for example that same amount of money would be worth 800,000 pesos today because each or, or 20,000 pesos turns into 800,000 today because I, if I'm not mistaken it's every peso so in 1970 is worth 40 pesos today or something like that maybe it's higher but anyway that creates um, a difference actually between what economists call the nominal wage and the real wage the nominal wage is what you actually earn so if you are given 37,000 pesos that is actually the nominal wage that is just like the absolute amount that you're getting not adjusted for anything yet but real wage happens a uh, real wage is what you get when you adjust that for inflation. So it's possible that you might have rising nominal wages, like from 10,000 in 1970, for the same job, now it's 37,000, but the growth of real wage is not the same. Which, uh, if it were the same, then the same job from 1970 right now would be um getting paid, it would be um it would be a salary of 800,000 or something like that per month, right? If real wage grew at the same time, that nominal wage grew. The problem is it doesn't grow at the same rate. Um, so the theory actually here is in in what they call that? In Econ. <laughs> I forgot what they call that. But like the theory, the economic theory here under labor economics is that when you have unemployment, it falls. What will end up happening is when more people get jobs, there will be a scarcity of laborers. So the first thing that actually you need to do is to hire as many people as possible. As many people should just say, okay, fine, I will just take this job right now. So if that happens, there will be a scarcity of laborers. And where, is a, where there is a scarcity of laborers, employers, corporations, because they still want to expand, they still want to compete, they will offer higher wages to attract more workers. So the theory here is when unemployment falls, real wages go up. But there are still problems with that theory. So one, it, it requires labor scarcity. But in the pandemic, right, <laughs> there isn't really a labor scarcity, in my opinion. There isn't a labor scarcity. Mm -hmm. So this model, this theory, can only start happening when more people are employed. The second problem is a lot of labor can actually be automated. So even when laborers, as in people, are scarce, it does not register in the labor market because as far as the corporation or the employer is concerned, robots or machines are workers too. So, wala talagang scarcity that happens. But third, even for labor that cannot be automated, so for example, HR reps or communications, yun yung sa atin eh, di ba? Communications job siya. Yeah, marketing. Com so, marketing, mar right? Yeah. Marketing cannot necessarily be automated as of now. But even if that happens, employers can still actually foster the idea na actually, there is no labor scarcity. It's it's not your labor that's scarce. It's the job that is scarce. So it flips the dynamic on its head. Instead of employers competing to have you, now the narrative is you must compete against other workers in order to get this underpaying job, even if there aren't a lot of competitors. <laughs> Right? So it's supply and demand, but make it jobs, basically. Yeah. So it's yeah. That, that's a basic. That's a basic gist of the labor market. There is always going to be supply and demand. But what makes um the market distorted is information asymmetry. Because if you are a poor laborer, you do not have access to a lot of information. You do not know like the state of the labor market. You do not know how scarce you are. But the employer knows because it has more resources with which it can know those things. 
And using that information asymmetry, it can shift the dynamics and prevent people from making rational decisions about how much they are worth, how much they should be paid. So that's the economic angle to the to the to the notion that everyone is just grossly underpaid. Everyone is grossly underpaid because people let themselves. Oh, oh my God! It sounds like I'm victim blaming. If people are grossly underpaid because they are manipulated by capitalist forces in order to accept underpayment, wage theft, those kinds of things. Because if they do not accept it, you are called entitled. You are you are told that, Grabe, my father would kill for this job or something like that. There are yeah, so many it, it seems to be a lot of uh, crab mentality within Filipinos, like preventing others from pursuing better opportunities because the past or the older generation had to go through hardship. Like, there's this notion that because I went through some tough shit, you gotta go through tough shit for us to be at the same page. When, you know, the reason why they worked hard or the reason why we work hard as a society is so that no one has to go through those things, right? So it's unfair to enforce them on others or try to make them go through the same things you're going through or you've went through before. But then, that's just my little rant against boomers, right? The last issue that we'd want to discuss for this episode, the final one before we end it, would be the suppression of voters' rights. Oh, vo- voters? Where did that come from? Laborers' rights during the excited pandemic. Excited ka? Excited ka for 2022? Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm excited for that. But I know there's also going to be suppression of voters' rights there, so maybe that's gonna oh, be wow. another episode. Ooh. Anyway, suppression of laborers' rights. So, today alone, there was a lot of instances of laborers' suppression. On Labor Day, um, by the time we're recording this, according to Rappler, at around 7 a.m., May 1, Kilosang Mayo Uno, or KMU, said that the police blocked their supposed venue for demonstration at the Liwasang, Liwasang Bonifacio in Manila. Um, so they were not allowed to gather. And this is like a yearly thing they do. They have mass yeah. protests in order to not just pay tribute to what took place in 1903, but as well as to demand for more rights because, like, let's face it, Filipinos are severely underpaid in a lot of instances. And even if we do have a comprehensive labor code, they're not the most optimal. And I'm sure Kyle has read through them and has found multiple flaws um, that you should not share because you are not a lawyer. <laughs> but, yeah. But I'm sure, but he has a lot of opinions on them. Uh, and the police has also tried to stop the labor coalition, like Pagawa, Pag- Pagawa, sorry. I don't know why I pronounced that wrong. Pagawa, along Lakson Avenue in Manila at around 8 a.m. when they marched towards Mendiola in Manila and were threatened with arrest. So that all just happened today. And the justification they had is, well, it's COVID. But that's not even true because didn't Pongo just have like an entire campaign run in uh, Dumaguete where yeah. mass gathering was around. So there's a lot of hypocrisy that's very evident. And it just seems to be a recurring instance. Even like in previous years without COVID, um, labor suppression was always taking place during May 1. Which is sad because that's the day we shouldn't be oppressing them. I mean, not that we should be oppressing them in any day. Oh my god, I'm just like digging myself multiple holes this episode. I'm just saying like out of all the days, this is a day we should be putting them on a pedestal, yet we are not doing so. Yeah. But most other days in the pandemic, outside of Labor uh, Labor Day, there seems to be a lot of oppression that um, employees go through on the daily, right? In general, it's hard to get a lot of jobs. It's hard to get any job. The fact that I said a lot of jobs just like proves that in my mind, like the way to survive is to have two or more jobs at the same time, right? And that's not a good mindset to have. But right now, especially, lower wages are happening across the board because of the justification that you're just working from home or that you're not using up a lot of resources anyway. You're just using what you already have, which is a shame. Because I think work is still work regardless of the place you're in. And people shouldn't be like deprived of money because the government is failing to address the pandemic. Like I think that's a them problem and not an us sounds problem. Like, it sounds like a you problem. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a you problem, government or employer. Like maybe you should have vaccinated all of us so that we can go back to the office or whatever. And it's also <laughs> lack of employer benefits. So they say that we can pay you less because we don't have to pay for other things like I don't know. I don't know what other things they usually but I I, I read this somewhere. Mga <laughs> but fringe I can't... benefits pa siya. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't get the fringe benefits like I don't know, the coffee, coffee from the office. Yeah, yeah like that stuff like that, right? And it's it's such a dumb argument in my head. But these are legitimate arguments I've seen companies run. So I went job hunting 
like a few months back and i remember like noticing that the wages being offered were significantly low if there were any wages at all presented and that's also another problem like people are so secretive with how much they're going to pay you until the interview portion so you waste a lot of your time until the last minute where you're just like oh i can't live with this but i went through so much hassle na and that's how they get you you know they get you because you have sunk so much already the sunk cost fallacy comes into play like i already answered so many of their surveys i went through so many interviews i made a resume for this a cover letter i dressed up for this i put on makeup i commuted all the way i 20,000 lang pala but this this might be the only job i'll get might as well take it and that's the trap yeah th- there's also a problem where you might get more work as in like more work is given to you because, because like, you're at home <laughs> and not just because you not just because you're at home but because like because of the pandemic the employer had to let some people go so that work fell onto you um so because you're given more work dapat may raise right you should get a raise but even if you do get a raise that raise is not proportional to the amount of money that uh, to the amount of work that was added to your you know to your to your life right so one of my friends i was gonna say exes so one of my friends I, I don't like defining people based on past relationships wow but, like, well, but one of my friends they were saying that they only earn like twenty five thousand. um and that was and, and i had to remember that in context the, even though this is twice minimum wage already they are doing the work for two people's jobs but oh. they're not yeah so like it, it's i if, if i'm mistaken it's almost double the work but not double the pay so that, that's an issue that you have but uh, again during this pandemic the suppression of these rights happened in the name of you know covid relief or you know preventing community transmissions the problem with that is it is very anti-poor first of all because remember you stay at home stay at home i mean i forget that person's name pero influencer you're not tiktok siya. you're not tiktok na parang <laughs> oh my god you're so dumb stay at home stay at home yeah i remember that yeah yung mga ganon but right now a lot of people have to go out because they need to go to work right and so that that's one of the reasons why there are more COVID COVID cases now. It's not really because like makulit lang talaga mga tao. They just they just love going out and getting COVID. They just yeah. love doing that. <laughs> it's not it's not because of that, right? It's because th- there has been a quarantine for a year now and a lot of these people are unskilled or less skilled or you, you know like there, there is a more PC term for this but yung, the way that they're denominated is they're less skilled meaning they can't really work from home you can't be a construction worker at home ganon <laughs> so like so they have to go out. So they have to go out, right? Yeah. So you can't expect everyone to stay at home. And so that's for most days. But for today, May 1, I saw my Ninang. Hi, Ninang. If you're listening... I'm gonna criticize you, so stop. Stop listening for now. But my Nina kasi, she shared um, photos of um, the KMU demonstrations, the Kilosao Mayo Uno um, demonstrations, mm-hmm. saying that common sense is not that common pala. Meaning to say that these protesters are contributing to the COVID-19 problem. So that's actually one of the strongest for me arguments is because it forces you to weigh that like is your right to protest more important than the right to uh, than the responsibility to lessen as much as possible um, COVID-19 transmission. You know what you should reply to your Ninang? I don't want to reply to my Ninang. I mean, you know what you should we're, do? We're on good terms kasi eh, but... hi, hi, hi Tita if you're listening. You know what I would do if I was friends? Am I friends with them on Facebook? I don't know. Probably not. Okay. But like, if I if I did, if I were her friend or their friend, I would find a photo of them eating out in like a restaurant and then I would comment. Common sense is not so common pala. Like Grabe, in every so photo. Mean. In every photo that they're outside of the house. Just Grabe, to that's so point. mean. It's okay when I criticize my Nina, but it's not okay. <laughs> no, I'm not criticizing your Nina particularly. I'm just criticizing people who do that in yeah, general. I, we are criticizing the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy, or the tagito, just the general narrative that you you literally have workers fighting for a dignified standard of living, and you are getting mad at them because of COVID. But why do you want to prevent COVID spread anyway? You want to prevent COVID spread. You want to prevent COVID spread because people have the right to life and it should not be jeopardized by other people acting like assholes and that's what these laborers are feeling 
their dignities, their like dignified standards of living are being taken away from them by asshole employers. So it's actually the same. It's the same. It's just that you are in a position of privilege that you cannot understand those plights, right? So, so, and also, by the way, I, I checked the, those photos because it looked like they were following social distancing, na man. It looked like they're following social distancing. Eh, yun naman pala. So it's not that bad. Yeah. So even if like this is a, a very important thing to to talk about, yung, like preventing the further spread of COVID-19, which I think it's fine. It's correct actually, but it shouldn't. be to deprive people altogether of their right to assembly. That's that's the that's the middle ground where everyone's rights can be respected. In my opinion, in my very humble opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's it. Uh, I think we covered a lot of things. Um, we, I, I think we went off script quite a lot. Like, quite a lot. Um, we just have a lot of feelings on Labor Day. I yeah. am rather sleepy, so I'm kind of sabog. Uh, I think did you drink? Yeah, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. A bit because like I finished my tax midterm and I was like, "Woo! I'm done with tax midterm." Yeah. So, let me drink uh, this. Let me drink this liquor which by the way is subject to excise tax. I hate it. Thanks. I hate it. But anyway, um we apologize for that ride of an episode. We hope you enjoyed listening to it anyway that you got some Um, educational things from it one way or another or if not then I hope you at least enjoyed the rants of Kyle and I so that's it for this episode of Debatable thank you so much happy Labor Day and we'll see you in the next one bye bye join Debatable InterVarsity join Debatable InterVarsity yeah. <laughs> that's not that's not even our outro